Welcome to you all, and thank you for joining us as we take you through the seventh lesson of the Cornerstone Connection for the first quarter 2024. My name is Mikael Flex, and on the panel, we have Subira, Shamala, Omwari, Sid, and our wonderful teens teachers. On sign language, we have Joyce, and on the orchestra, we have Subira and Shema. Now, let me take you through the mission story. The title is Peace in a Teen Home, and it's from Nepal. It starts off with Anita, who lives in a small house on a small piece of land in, town, in a small town in eastern Nepal. Five people live in the small house, father, mother, grandmother, and Amita and Amita's little brother. Many families grow their own food on the land around the houses in Nepal. But the small piece of land around Amita's house was too small to grow enough food to feed her family. So, father and mother had to work extra hard to feed her, the family. Father and mother had never gone to school, so they couldn't read or write. They had never studied to work as a bus driver or a plumber or a teacher. So they worked with their hands, picking things up, putting things down, moving things around. Sometimes they carried bricks or dug ditches, and other times they planted and harvested crops. It was difficult to pick up things, put things down, and move things around every single day. After a long day of work, father and mother were very tired when they came home. They wanted to relax. They tried relax by drinking alcohol. But when father and mother drank, they began to argue. When they drank, they began to fight. The more they drank, the more they fought. The more they fought, the more they drank. Soon father and mother seemed to be drinking and fighting all the time. Neighbors heard the fighting and came to the small teen house to try and help. Then the leaders of the small town tried to help. Even the police came and tried to help, but nothing changed. Father and mother kept drinking and fighting. Then mother left. She got tired of drinking and fighting. She wanted a better life. She moved away to India to work. Asmita was left at home. Now only four people lived in the small teen house. Father, grandmother, Amisa, and Asmita's small little brother. When mother was gone, Admita was put in charge of the house. She cooked the meals and cleaned up. It was hard work to pick things up, put things down, and move things around all day long. It was difficult living with father. He kept on drinking. When he drank, there was no peace at home. It seemed like life will never get better. Then grandma started going to church on Sabbath, and she came back very happy. She came back home with a smile, and grandmother told her the stories about God of heaven, whom she had heard about at church. Amita had never heard this of this God. Her family worshipped gods of stone and wood, and Amita liked the stories about the God of the Adventist church. One Sabbath, Amita decided to go to church with grandmother. She left her housework and took her little brother by the hand. They went to church together. Other children warmly welcomed Amita to the children's Sabbath school. The teacher gave her a big smile. Asmita immediately knew she wanted to go to church every Sabbath. Today, Asmita is 12 years old, and every week she sings songs and recites Bible verses in Sabbath school. She is so happy. Life has become so much better with God. Every Sabbath, Asmita asks Father to come to church too. And she is praying that he will agree. I think that if Father comes to church, he will stop drinking and we will have peace at home, she said. Part of this quarter's 13th Sabbath offering will help establish a school where children like Asmita can study in eastern Nepal. Thank you for planning a generous 13th Sabbath offering.
Welcome to our lesson discussion for today. This is lesson seven of the Cornerstones Connections lesson. This quarter, we've been looking at the stories that led to the stories in the kingdom of Israel that were happening during the time the kingdom was split. And at this time, it was the northern and the southern kingdom. Today's lesson will be focusing on the history of the king Jeroboam. And the title of the lesson is the Jeroboam syndrome, the Jeroboam syndrome. Before we begin, I'd like to introduce the panelists who will be serving together with me. And I'll start from my left and everyone can introduce themselves. Um, I'm Sid. My name is Omweri. Yes. My name is Shamala. Mm -hmm. My name is Sabira Kundi, and I'm happy to be here. Yes, thank you, everyone. We'll be sharing about the Jeroboam syndrome, and it's an interesting lesson with many take-homes for all of us. So please stay tuned and listen to what God's Word has in store for us. Before we begin, I'd like to invite Omweri to give us an opening prayer, and he can lead us as we start. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for today, for giving us this opportunity to meet here and discuss the lesson, Lord. Please help us to, to teach well what you have understood by reading, and for not us to speak, but for the Holy Spirit to speak through us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 To, to begin, we'll start off with the what do you think section. It has some statements which we can either say are true or false. I'll start and then I'll continue towards my rights. So the first one is what may be a sin for you may or may not be a sin for me. I would say that this is true and this is from a verse in James chapter Verse seven. Yeah, James four seventeen. And it says, "If anyone then knows the good they ought to do it, and doesn't do it, it is sin for them." Mm. So, if you don't know that something is wrong, then God can. It's not a sin for you personally, but once you find out it's wrong and you continue, then it it will become a sin. Okay, I'm worried. I think I had a bit of a different opinion mm. um, when it comes to this statement. And mostly it's because that's the way it's worded, but I'm very glad that you gave clarity on the question. But really, the way it's worded it sort of feels as if it's a sin for you, but it's not a sin for me. Mm. Therefore, there's no accountability there. Mm -hmm. And I think sin is sin. It should be called out regardless. Mm -hmm. But the Bible equally states, just like you said, that there's different measurements of sin mm -hmm. based on knowledge of it. So we as Christians, we as teens who are aware of the law and what God expects of us, we should keep his word and consistently obey him, mm -hmm. recognizing that the things that we do wrong is actually sin. So calling sin for what it is. Yes. And even as we progress through our Christian experiences, it, there are some things that we don't know are sinful right now. But as we learn to know more and more about God, we actually realize that it is sinful. So for sure, uh, it's a growing journey that we have. And the next statement is, sin is nothing more than a bad choice. Um, I'm a bit torn on this, but for sure, all sins are bad choices, just that some are made unconsciously. But I'd be more willing to say that this is true unless someone has a different thought. <laughs> yes, I think the more than mm -hmm. just mm -hmm. a bad choice. Sin is a bad choice, and we mm -hmm. make bad choices daily, mm -hmm. but are they always sin? Mm -hmm. I think sin also deals with the heart, mm -hmm. and that's what makes it really bad, because once you sin, mm -hmm. you are choosing mm -hmm. most definitely, not just externally, but internally, mm -hmm. on who you have your allegiance to. Mm -hmm. And is it God or is it Satan? So I think sin is deeper because it deals with the heart. And it's the turning and the twisting of your heart. 
So I think we should think of it more of, yes, it is a bad choice, but mm -hmm. that choice has spiritual consequences. Mm. So we can say all sins are bad choices, not, but not all bad choices are sins. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Shamala, you go next. Uh, some sins are worse than others. I believe that is false. Um, mm -hmm. Because a sin is a sin, you know? Just because someone has murdered someone else and you have stolen someone else's item doesn't mean that you have committed any lesser sin than them, mm. in my view. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I think we, God has like all, all sin is bad, definitely. But in society, we have degrees of sin. That's why a murderer goes for sentence to life and mm -hmm. someone who lies just gets a pass or breaks a relationship. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think the next statement says there are always bad consequences to sin. On earth, I don't think that's always true because there's so many people who are in high positions and mm -hmm. they sin constantly, mm -hmm. but they're rewarded actually mm -hmm. because this world is twisted. It's not fully the kingdom of heaven. Mm -hmm. But there are bad consequences in the afterlife. And what God says is what you sin, the wages of sin is death. Mm -hmm. So for the, in the Christian mindset, there is bad consequences for every sin that you commit. Mm -hmm. um, unless, of course, you repent. But presently in the world, unfortunately, it's not as accountable as it needs to be. Mm. So before Sid goes, I actually wanted to clarify something on the previous one. Right. that says that some sins are worse than others. I actually have a different thought to Shamala's <laughs> that mm -hmm. some sins are worse than others. I, I definitely say that this is true. And I bring it with an example in society. Uh, if you are caught stealing a sweet at a shop, you might be charged or taken to prison. But if you are caught murdering someone, you'll be given a life, life. sentence. Right. Yeah. So if you're to take things to the court of law, then for some sins, you'll be punished more. And I believe this is true also with God. Uh, in the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 12, Jesus says that, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. So when we consider it from this perspective, there are some people who receive a greater reward than others. Mm -hmm. Now, we know that the Bible says the wages of sin is death. Like, that's the payment for sin, or the reward of sinfulness is death, in a sense. So basically speaking, somebody who sins more will receive a greater punishment than someone who sins less. But it doesn't lessen the fact that all of them will die as a result of, result of sin. So I, I thought it would be nice to drive the clarity there based on what the Bible says. Yeah, so Sid, you can go on with the next one. Um, the next one is if we ask for if we ask forgiveness for our sins, God God forgets them forever. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna have to agree with that because mm -hmm. God says forgive and forget. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Forgive um, and forget. Um, mm -hmm. I do have a kind. You said you agreed with that. Yeah. Okay. I I think God doesn't forget because he's aware of it. Mm -hmm. There's a knowledge of it. Um, forgiveness, of course, is definitely not holding you hostage on it. So he doesn't hold grudges, which mm -hmm. I think is very good. But I think he's still aware of our tendencies and what we have done in the past, but he's equally willing to move forward. Mm. So to drive clarity on this, God will forgive us of our sins, though he may not necessarily forget it, but he'll wipe us clean such that we are not liable to be punished for the sin that we have committed. Right. So God is forgiving us entirely on mm -hmm. the sin. Yeah. So we'll go to the next one. Uh, before I continue, mm -hmm. I would want to comment on there are always bad consequences to sin. Mm. I think what you might think as a, a bad consequence can differ from what God thinks as a bad consequence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you can choose, for example, to, let's say you earn a good amount of money, and after you've taken care of everything, you can just use to spend it, like, you know, to not even pay tithe or anything. Mm -hmm. 
you may think that it doesn't have any consequences for you, but then mm. there's someone who needed that money and it's a bad consequence for them. Mm. But you, you think you're, unaffec you're unaffected. Mm. So I just want to say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for clarifying that. Mm -hmm. And if my sin doesn't harm anyone, it's not really a sin. I would definitely say that this is false mm. because, for example, like you can also harm yourself by doing some sins against your body. Of course, that's how you know sexual sins are. That's how they're defined in the Bible. Not only that, but I think sin is hurting God constantly. Amen. So every time we do sin, even though it doesn't have an effect on human bodies, but um, God's heart is definitely saddened every time we sin. Mm. Yeah, so sin by definition is transgression of God's law. And God's law has two precepts. Uh, love for God and love for mm -hmm. fellow human beings. So if you break any of those two, that's where sin is actually categorized. Right. So for sure, if sin doesn't harm anyone, it may be harming God in that sense. Yeah. And if you harm yourself, then you're the temple of God. So you are destroying God's temple, which is offensive to God for sure. Yeah. Before we continue, uh -huh. I want to say the whole reason we were given the law mm. is to, you know, for us to live a better life. Mm -hmm. Of course, you might see it as more limiting, but then mm. that's when you're in the world. When you accept, you know, you accept Christ, then you can see that it's a better life. Mm -hmm. So what you can see as not hurting anyone, as has been said, it can be pulling you away from God. Mm. Amen. Yeah, Amen. And it's really crucial for us to recognize sin in relation to um, humanity, because sometimes in some other religions and faiths, you really condemn humanity, um, see them as less of uh, very evil, which we do have evil tendencies for sure. Mm -hmm. But in the what do you think section, it says God despises sin, but always loves the sinner. Mm -hmm. That distinction is really important because God has deep, deep love for us because he created us, but he despises the sin that we engage in. Mm. Yes, yes. And the next one is sin is separation from God. Shamala, what do you think? I believe that is true. Mm -hmm. uh, citing the example of Adam and Eve, they were sent away from the Garden of Eden and separated, not just physically, mm. but also just their bond with God was broken mm. because of their sin. And God is hurt by our sin and doesn't want it to separate us from him, and that is why we are called to repentance. Yeah. That's yeah. my opinion. There's a breach of relationship, and mm -hmm. um, we are forever scarred, I think. But mm -hmm. with the whole thing of redemption, renewal, there is that mm -hmm. restoration that comes if we choose to repent. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks, Subira. So we want you to actually take us through the story of how sin separates us from God, and specifically focusing on the Jeroboam syndrome. But before you do that, just answer the last one. Sin is too often ignored in churches today. Do you think this is true or it is, is it false? Oh, wow, I think that's a really deep question. <laughs> and it's difficult to say, but some, I think certain sins are ignored in churches. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason is because when people come to church, I think um, I've always been told church is like a hospital. We mm -hmm. check in as, peop as patients, mm -hmm. people who are sick, and we are sick with the syndrome. Mm -hmm. And as a result, we are coming to be changed, to be um, given treatment through the Holy Spirit and the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And I think certain sins are ignored, and that's on the part of us, because we are the church. We mm -hmm. should recognize the presence of sin, and that's the only way. Once we know what sins that we're committing, mm -hmm. it's opening a free space for us to truly get the treatment mm -hmm. that we need. And we see that in the story. So let's dive in. Mm -hmm. So... Jeroboam thought to himself, and he said, the kingdom will now likely revert to the house of David. If these people go and offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord at Jerusalem, and they will turn to give allegiance to their king, Rehoboam, king of Judah. This is his brother. 
they will kill me and return to King Jeroboam. So after seeking advice, King Jeroboam actually made two golden cows. He set one in Bethel and the other in Dan. And these people actually committed sin. They continued and decided to come and worship at the one in Bethel and went as far to worship in Dan. By the word of the Lord, a man of God came from Judah to Bethel. And he met Jeroboam there standing in front of the altar about to offer a sacrifice. And the man of God gave a sign, which he received from the Lord. He said, this is the sign the Lord has declared. The altar will be split apart and ashes poured out on it. When King Jeroboam heard this um, from the man of God, he cried out against the altar. He stretched out his hand and said, seize him. That very moment, his hand shriveled up so he couldn't pull it back. Then the king said to the man of God, please intercede for me that I can be able to restore my hand. So the man of God interceded for him with the Lord and the king's hand was restored. Mm. So there was a certain prophet, an old prophet living in Bethel, whose sons came and said, oh, the man of God has come from Judah. Would you like to meet him? So he told his sons to go and find him. Once he found him sitting under an oak tree, the old prophet said, Are you the man who came from Judah? I am, he replied. So the prophet said to him, Come, eat and drink with me. But the man of God said, I cannot come, eat bread or drink water with you because the Lord said, you must not eat bread or drink water there or return by the way which you came. So the old prophet answered, I too am a prophet. But of course he was lying. So the man of God returned with the old man and ate and drank in his house. This was a big mistake because Immediately after, the prophet who had brought him back cried out to the man of God. And he said, you have defied the word of the Lord. Therefore, your body will not be buried with your ancestors. Wow. It's a really great story and understanding how sin has its deep effects. It's really something that has infected all humanity. So my question to you guys is, do you believe that sin is a disease? What is the diagnosis and how is it treated? Jamala? I believe sin is a disease in the way that it can, that it results to death in the same way that physical diseases do. And the diagnosis is dissecting the word of the Lord and understanding that which we do that may be wrong according to that which he says. And the treatment is a very personal decision to step up to the plate and try to correct that which you've done wrong. Of course, with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, with the, which the Lord has granted us. Amen. Amen. Anyone else with any thoughts? Yeah, I believe uh, sin is a disease that only has one doctor. That's Jesus Christ because he's the only one who can take away our sins. And it's one of those diseases that death has to occur for it to be taken away. So it's either us who die or it's Christ who dies. So for us as Christians, we believe that Jesus took all our sins and died for them on the cross. For which if we do not uh, confess to him to take our sins, then we'll have to die ourselves. So sin is a disease that we either die or it's Christ that dies. So uh, something that I pray that all Christians may do, give your sins to Jesus so that he may take care of the disease. And that's the only way to treat it. Yeah. Absolutely. And sin, like you said, is the wear and tear of the flesh. It really eats up the flesh. And our job is to make that personal choice, that decision to come to church, places like this and open spaces to truly trust in God because he's the doctor. He's the great physician. Mm. Okay. Another question is, it really talks about how King Jeroboam reached out and stretched out his arm and said, seize him. That very moment, his hand decided to shrivel. So Ellen White calls this the palsied arm. 
My question is, what are examples of palside arms in the Bible that you can see? Anyone would like to go? I would say that when, when Paul, when he was on an island after he got shipwrecked, mm -hmm. a snake, one, you know, it beat him, but he was okay, even though the locals thought that he was going to die. I think this was just God protecting yeah, Paul from death. So the palsied arm shows God's protection. Jeroboam is trying to take hold of the prophet of God. And when he puts forth his hand, then God shrinks his arm away and says, this is not just a normal man. This is a prophet who I've sent with my word. Do you want to take my word away? Yeah. So that comes out clearly as well in the story of Paul. I believe it also comes out in the story of the Daniel and the lion's den, when God shuts the mouths of lions, even when the king thinks that, King Darius thinks that Daniel is going to be eaten against his will. In fact, he actually comes to check up on him the next day. I think he, he really loved Daniel <laughs> to the point of doing that. Right. Yeah. I think I also see in the story of Balaam where mm -hmm. um, he's being called out to go and curse the Israelites. But really, all that comes out of his mouth is blessings. Mm -hmm. And what that really shows me is that the palsied arm, of course, is like, you should definitely go out and curse and through speech. But God actually limits speech. And for his chosen people, make sure that only blessings are bestowed upon them. Mm -hmm. Wonderful insights here. And the last question is, it says, and I quote, here are your gods, Israel, who brought you up out of Egypt. Now, this is what Jeroboam used to sort of convince his people to worship idols. Why was this so convincing for the Israelites? Shamala? I think I'd rather you give more insight. Oh, absolutely. I think it was extremely convincing because them coming out of Egypt was deep into their culture, where even things like the Passover came out from it. And the whole long time, 400 years of slavery all the way in Egypt was really saddening, but equally a revelation because people like Moses came out of that and he was able to be led through that and the whole Israelite population was extremely grateful to God. Now Jeroboam is using this to actually lead them into sin. So he has deep and amazing power and I think Shamala will touch light on that when we get to Tuesday. Mm. Thank you. So as we proceed, I'd like uh, Shamala to read Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. And it says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from their flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. Mm. Amen. Amen. So relating this to the key text, Mary, what does this tell us? I would say, of course, you know, you, you reap what you sow. Mm. If, you, if you go according to the flesh, then that's, that means that that's what you want. You, that's what you're putting energy towards. Mm. Even in smaller things that you do, if you put energy towards something, it's going to grow. Mm. So we should direct our energies towards God. Mm. On Monday, there's a, a person called Wayne that he observes that many people think about the presence of God with sentimental familiarity. They think of him as, you know, one of your buddies. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's good to think of God as your friend, but then you have to remember this is, you have, you have to be serious about God. It's not a light relationship. Because anything that has value, you have to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And you can't pay for that with money. You have to give up some parts of your life for you to have a deeper relationship with God. Mm -hmm. And this Jeroboam, it can be thought of that he had a light relationship with God. He might think that he's just there to help him when, you know, for example, when he got his arm hurt. But then, otherwise, he wasn't really thinking about God most of the time. 
he was thinking about you know keeping power to himself keeping the people to himself and this this is evident in people today the way they your light with God. You can just you can come to church, of course, and you sing nicely. But then when you go home, you forget about it. The way you can see a friend one day, then you don't think about them the rest of the time. That's not how we should treat God. We should be we should be focused on Him. He should be the main thing in our life. Yeah. Amen. Amen. We are to read through Hebrews four, and I would like to point out verse twelve which says, For the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Verse 13 goes on and says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Hmm. Jeroboam sinned in the way that he ignored the covenant way of life and decided to go his own way, ignoring the fact that God would have to judge him and punish him for leading the people astray. In today's flashlight, we learn that Jeroboam was a servant of Solomon and therefore was in a position to bring about wise reforms in both civil and religious affairs. He had shown aptitude and sound judgment and knowledge during his years of service to Solomon. But Jeroboam failed to make God his trust. Mm. And that is why this prophet, this man of God, was sent to him to tell him that Josiah will come and take over your kingdom because you have led the people astray. You have ignored all the teachings that you had gained from Solomon and mm. come and done things in your own way, built altars, golden calves, appointed priests from any tribe that you'd like, mm -hmm. and therefore all the blessings that you would have probably received while guiding God's people will be taken away from you. Absolutely, and I really like that statement um, on Tuesday where Jeroboam was in a position to bring about wise reforms in both civil and religious affairs. And it really talks about the political hold mm -hmm. that he really had in that moment. So his choice was definitely to resort to sin and as a result, he guided a whole nation into sin on the bad side of God. So in where we are as teens, we might even be moving into leadership positions. Let us be very mindful of the opportunities that we have. Because these opportunities can be able to lead other people to Christ. It's an evan evangelical step that we can take or a step to really lead people astray. And I think God will make sure that we are accountable for that. Amen. Thanks for sharing that, Subir. So I'd like to invite uh, Sid to read First John, chapter 1, verse 7. And then Shamali, you can take us through what this means for us. So Sid. First John, chapter 1, verse 7 says, mm -hmm. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The first question is, what is God trying to teach me through the story of Jeroboam? I will begin by citing a verse in John 15, verse 5, where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Mm. I think from the story of Jeroboam, God is trying to teach us that if we stray away from that which he instructs us to do, we cannot bear good fruit. We cannot have a good harvest because mm. we have separated ourselves from that which he says. Mm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Well, I think what I, I get from this story really is twisted citations. I think what the devil is very, very good at is the language that he uses, since he's very much aware of the Bible and the word of God, he manipulates it. And we kind of see this with Jeroboam. He um, really says that these gods are the ones who took you out of Egypt. That's a very powerful statement because that's tapping into their culture and tapping into what God has spiritually done for them. So I think the citations from God are more credible and they're more purposeful. They have more value. 
So I think from Jeroboam's story, I really think that once you are battling against the devil and his works and against sin, you really need to use citations from the Lord and truly dig into his word and apply it most definitely. So from what I hear, what you're saying is basically Matthew 4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, mm -hmm. but by every word that comes from the, for the mouth of God. Yes. Carry on, Shamala. The other question is, what are the specific benefits to me when I sell out to God? Mm. What benefits do we get from surrendering to God? Yes. Mm. When we surrender to God, we give up a lot of our, our sinful habits that we might have gotten used to them, we enjoy them. But then now we'll get more fulfilled for sure by you know, doing things for a greater purpose, not just living for yourself. It also opens up a new community for you to enter the church. And it just, if you're even not sure about what, you, like what career you could choose, you can be sure that you know, there's something I should be doing, and that's living for God. So there's a, mm. you know, a certainty of your life that comes with it. I think it's definitely, I think it's freedom. When we are entering into sin, it's slavery. The Bible really says that we are slaves to sin as mm. once we really engage in it. So what God offers is freedom because we are not tied to anything. We have no guilt, no shame. And these things are really the consequences of sin. So once we realize what God has to offer and us surrendering, surrendering ourselves, it's beautiful because we get to be free and to live in unity with him. Amen, amen. So we'll move on to the punchlines, and I'd like Sid to take us through this. Okay, so in the, the different verses, and um, we'll each pick a verse, and then we'll see why it speaks to us. So mm -hmm. maybe we can start from Sufira coming down this way. Okay. Okay, um, beautiful verses here. I think Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 and 8. And it reads, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the spirit from the spirit will reap eternal life. I think it definitely puts our lives at, in a sense of we can write our own script. Mm -hmm. Not entirely, but every choice that we make, every action that we take, just as Jeroboam did, we are feeding into the syndrome. So this is really just telling us that God cannot be mocked. Everything that we do will lead to results, good ones or bad ones. Amen. The verse that spoke to me was 1 John 1 verse 7, and it says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. It's just a reminder of God's endless grace that we can be purified from that which we do wrong, that we, cannot, that we are not separated from him forever, and we can always be reconciled. Yes. Amen. Amen. I love Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19. Uh, first, because Ezekiel chapter 11 says that God takes no pleasure in the death of sinners in earlier verses. But now God goes on to say, I will give them an undivided heart and put a new spirit in them. I will remove from their heart from them their heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. When I think about it, Jeroboam hardened his heart. He made his heart a stony place, such that even when God sent the prophet to rebuke him for the actions that he was taking, he now says, seize him. So when God says he'll take away the stony heart and give me a heart of flesh, it means that God wants to take away the syndrome. It's not me to take sin away from myself, it's actually God working with me to take the sin away. So that really speaks deeply to me. Mm -hmm. My favorite verse is Luke 13, 34. Mm. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who killed the prophets and stoned those who sent you. How often I'll have longed to gather your, ch your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were not willing. Especially this last part, Choose God's willingness to, to have communion with us. 
but then us, we are not willing. Mm. You know, you can say that you're willing, but then over here you, you talk with your actions, not with what you say. Mm. And we need to, you know, we need to change our mindset about how we live. Amen. Sid. Um, normally I'd say mine is James 1417, but it's the last one. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll go with it anyway. So it says, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is a sin for them. Mm. This verse was, I believe, was mentioned when you were doing the what do you think section. It was the first one, what may be a sin for you may not be a sin for me. Mm -hmm. This verse, it it sh it's like, how do I put this? Like if you knew what you're doing is wrong, and then you still do it, mm. I'm not saying it's not a sin. I mean, it it is a sin. But then, like, you don't know. So maybe, maybe God mm -hmm. could be a bit more lenient on you, mm. considering you never knew it was a sin. Yeah. But if you, if, if you know it's a sin, then, and you do it, mm. then, yeah, you're completely on the wrong. Yes, yes. Amen. The Bible actually says at the time of ignorance, God wings. But now when he has told you what to do, he commands everyone to repent from their deeds. Now on the theme of repentance, when you have a syndrome, the best way to go back to God is actually through repentance. In the book Prophets and Kings, uh, we like to read a statement that says, yet the Lord did not give Israel up without first doing all that he could be done to lead them back to their allegiance to him. Through long dark years when ruler after ruler stood up in bold defiance of heaven and led Israel deeper and still deeper into idolatry, God sent message after message to his backslidden people. Through his prophets, he gave them every opportunity to stay the tide of apostasy and return to him. Even in the darkest hours, some would remain true to their divine ruler and, then the, and in the midst of idolatry would live blameless in the sight of a holy God. These faithful ones were numbered among the goodly remnant through whom the eternal purpose of Jehovah was to be fulfilled. When the 10 tribes were led into apostasy, there are people who did not agree with the things that Jeroboam did. So even the world we live in today is like a syndrome. Idolatry exists in many forms. There are many things calling us to do the wrong. And we are called upon as God's faithful people, even as teenagers, to still trust in God and do that which is right. So I'd like to invite everyone to quickly give us short closing thoughts from what they learned in this lesson. And we'll start from Sid and finally go to Subir. Um, I would just like to say that, you know, when you're facing dark times, like you're in a tunnel, there is light at the end of every tunnel, and the light in our case is Jesus Christ. Mm. So if you turn to him, you will you'll definitely succeed. Amen. I'm weary. Mine is when, when we drift from God, we, we might think that we are sinful, you know. Of course we are, but... God can still accept us back. So even after you sin, don't give up. Just remember that God still loves you and you know, he wants you to be with him. Amen. Shamala? I think the story of Jeroboam clearly brought out Proverbs 3, 5, uh, 3 verse 5 and 6 out clearly. Uh, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not in your own understanding. Submit to him and he'll make your path straight. Amen. Yeah, I think um, what I get from this is how the syndrome is fully cured is if, is if we truly accept the direct citations from the Lord and lead a life of repentance, walking in the light. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining us in our lesson today. We'll meet again next week for lesson eight. And I'd like to invite uh, Shamala 
to offer a closing word of prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the lesson that we've had. We thank you for the reflections that we've had on our own mistakes. And we pray that you will help us to trust in your word and to submit our ways to you, that we may not lean on our own understanding. Continue to bless us and guide us. It's all in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.